Good afternoon and welcome to Rackham's reception honoring the 2024 University of Michigan inductees to the Edward A. Boucher Graduate Honor Society. Um, I just want to do a quick introduction. My name is Chloe Secor, she, her, hers. I'm an academic program specialist at Rackham Graduate School where these past few months I've had the privilege of supporting our Boucher inductees and the program. As many of you know, the Edward Alexander Boucher Graduate Honor Society was named for the first Afri African American to receive a doctoral degree in the United States, completing his PhD in physics in, at Yale University in 1876. The Honor Society recognizes outstanding scholarly achievement and promotes diversity and excellence in doctoral education and the professoriate. Boucher also seeks to develop a network of scholars who exhibit all hallmarks of excellence in graduate study and are exemplary in five cardinal areas, scholarship, leadership, character, service, and advocacy. The founding chapters of the Boucher Graduate Honor Society are Yale University, where Edward Boucher received his degree, and Howard University, one of the top producers of African-American PhDs in the country. The Honor Society now has 19 chapters and is still growing every year. The aims and ideals of the Boucher Society are consistent with Rackham Graduate School's commitment to academic and inclusive excellence. The University of Michigan's chapter was founded in 2009, and this year's cohort represents our 16th group of inductees, now totaling over 100 members. I would like to now introduce Assistant Dean Ethram Brammer, who will be providing a few welcoming remarks, as well as the territorial acknowledgement. Thank you, Chloe, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's uh, celebration of our Boucher inductees for 2004, or 2024. It's a pleasure to be with you all today for today's celebration, including those of you who are able to join us in person, as well as those who are joining us online via live stream. I'd like to begin by expressing my sincerest gratitude and appreciation for Zana Quiser. I thought I saw Zana walking around. Uh, Chloe Secour, Paul Artale, Josh Caldwell, and all of those at Rackham, as well as in Michigan Media, who contributed to the success of Boucher on our campus, and without whom none of this would be possible. So an applause for all of them. Please. As we honor the historic and barrier-shattering legacy of Edward Alexander Boucher, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor campus, resides on the ter uh, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, ceded through the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. Of course, even in those, uh, for those viewing online, no matter where you are joining us from around Turtle Island, what is now known as North America, you are also on native land as well, and it's important to honor that fact. However, here at the University of Michigan, in particular, we have a special relationship with our native communities. Because in 1817, the Ojibwa, Adawa, and Badawatimi nations ceded land through the Treaty of Fort Mix. During those historic treaty negotiations, tribal leadership advocated for educational diversity, access, and opportunity through the inclusion of Article 16, which made clear that a specific portion of the land being ceded would be set aside so that their children could be educated. This advocacy by indigenous community on behalf of future generations of students from diverse backgrounds is an essential chapter of the origin story of the University of Michigan. We as an institution only exist as we do today due to their ancestral struggle for peace, justice, and equitable access to education. So we thank those seven generations of Anishinaabe ancestors who came before us for their vision and their advocacy, and we look to learn from their example as we continue to struggle for greater social equity for the next seven generations to come. Having just returned from the Yale uh, induction ceremony last week, I think it's uh, particularly important to note that with Yale's own version, of our inclusive history project. We're seeing these kind of uh, proliferate throughout the United States, and I think it's a good thing, um, looking at the inclusive histories of, of our institutions. They emphasize what could have been during this conference, because they now know 
that New Haven, Connecticut, could have been the site of the United States' first historically black um, college or university in our nation's history, and it wasn't. And they know now why it wasn't by um, you know, diving into the archives and the historical record. And it's largely due, as you can imagine, to systemic racial exclusion. Indeed, in the same way, we could ask ourselves on our own campus what could have been had Article 16 been honored from the very beginning of our institution, making us perhaps the first truly multicultural and pluralistic university valuing multiple cultural ways of knowing and being and learning. Edward Boucher, of course, in his own right, was an extremely important ancestor in this struggle for racial and social justice through access and opportunity education especially graduate education. And you all represent the next generation of ancestral giants upon whose shoulders future generations will stand, which is why we're so thrilled to be able to celebrate you all in this way today. And so to help us do just this, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dean Michael J. Solomon, the Dean of the Rackham Graduate School and Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Ethram, and good afternoon, everyone. I am very delighted to be able to join in welcoming all of you here today as we take part in our annual Rackham Boucher Graduate Honor Society reception. Whether you are here in person or joining us virtually, I'm very pleased to celebrate our 10 newest Boucher inductees with their faculty advisors, friends, and family members. I look forward to their introduction and their recognition and from hearing from them as well. Thank you for joining us today. And I would like to uh, make a special thank you to the dissertation advisors uh, and chairs who are here with us today as well. During my time as Dean, some of the most important work we have pursued here in the graduate school relates to our vision of what graduate education should encompass at the University of Michigan and how we support it. Central to that vision is to strengthen diversity and inclusion and students' sense of belonging in Rackham programs. While so much about the university and the world has changed since I became Dean five years ago, our commitment to that vision has not. The Graduate School continually strives to foster an environment in which members of our community feel valued and welcome, and in which we embrace the perspectives of students who come to us from across the country, around the world, and from a broad range of backgrounds and circumstances. Creating a sense of belonging in our students in their programs is vital for an organization like Rackham, which has a responsibility to address the gaps in inclusion and support that are part of our history as a predominantly white institution. This work also counters the growing threats to diversity, equity, and inclusion we are seeing nationally on campuses and in workplaces at the moment. As I reflected on this current situation, as well as the values of the Boucher Honor Society, I thought about how Rackham is trying to fulfill its own responsibility. If there's one thing I've heard from the Rackham community, it's that Rackham needs to provide more than words. It needs to show action and movement on these important issues. As I consider that necessity, I thought of some of the concrete steps we have tried to take. In 2022, we announced that we would discontinue the use of the GRE and doctoral admissions. The GRE and its associated financial costs have too often deterred well-qualified prospective students from applying to a Rackham PhD program. And that has disproportionately impacted students from groups historically excluded from our institution, from first-generation college graduates, and from Pell Grant eligible students as well. To help accommodate this change, we have in concert offered holistic admissions consultation to faculty to provide tailored support to individual doctoral programs, working with their admissions committees to understand how to Im implement holistic admissions. We have also worked collaboratively to expand opportunities for students in graduate and professional education by strengthening pathways between University of Michigan and minority serving institutions. And I'm particularly excited by how those relationships have grown and can grow further in the future. We have also launched a professional development DEI certificate program designed to prepare graduate students and postdoctoral fellows to work in a diverse environment 
while fostering a climate of inclusivity. We'll be honoring this year's certificate recipients next week. And finally, we've undertaken a multi-stage review of the Rackham Merit Fellowship Program, the graduate school's largest single investment. This effort is designed to best position this prestigious fellowship for the future and further its goal of recruiting, supporting, and graduating outstanding students who contribute to our goals of climate inclusion and diversity. These are just a few examples of how Rackham itself strives to embody the values of the Boucher Graduate Honor Society. Of course, even given all that we are doing, we are still keenly aware that there is much yet to do. Several inductees today have already contributed directly to this important work, and I am so grateful for your continued contributions through your scholarship, your leadership, and your advocacy as members of the Boucher Society. I firmly believe that Rackham's work and yours are both well aligned and mutually beneficial. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate this year's inductees to our chapter of the Edward A. Boucher Graduate Honor Society. Please join me in a round of applause as we celebrate their achievements. Thank you. <laughs> Back to Chloe. Back to Chloe, thank you. Hello, it's me again. <laughs> All right, uh, we will now move on to presenting our um, inductees with their certificates as well as their three minute thesis presentations. Um, our first person here, let me actually use the clicker. Here we go. Our first inductee today uh, is Brittany Rivera Brown. She's a joint PhD candidate in social work and psychology at the University of Michigan. Her work focuses on the impact of racism and intersectional oppression on black youth's mental health. Uh, her work underscores the resilience strategies black youth employ and the significance of culturally specific interventions for well-being. Brittany earned a master's in social work at Columbia University and a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Pepperdine University. Brittany couldn't join us today because she's on a well-earned vacation in Cancun with her partner. So yes, exactly. Round of applause for that and also for her. All right, Ariana, are you here? <laughs> Yay, you made it. OK, awesome. Best, best part of the day is everyone's making it. All right. <laughs> so our next inductee uh, is Ari Ariana Bueno. She is a PhD candidate in the Applied Physics Program at University of Michigan. She conducts her research in the Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering Department on instrumentation to study plume surface interactions, or PSI, on the moon. Ariana is a NASA, 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 NASA GRC fellow. She completed her master's in space engineering with a concentration in instrumentation and is pursuing a graduate certificate in Latina studies focusing on Latinx representation in STEM fields. Okay. Yep, and you can bring that. You can come up right now and then just click over. There's your slide oh, behind okay. you, and you can speak into this mic. Wait, do I not have a three minute timer anywhere? Can I bring my timer? <laughs> do you want me to start one for you? Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I get the three minutes. Sorry, I need to be professional with my three minute thesis one. Because <laughs> Wami, one of the other inductees, and I, my friend Tasha is also here, also did the three minute thesis, so you know I gotta show up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. So we are going to the moon. Um, Artemis program is a new, obviously, oh, move this way. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, let me start again. The timer doesn't count. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Mess this up. All right. Hi, everyone. So we are going to the moon again. Uh, so if you haven't heard, Artemis program is our new mission that NASA has employed to send astronauts robots and a bunch of really innovative technologies to the moon to study more of the surface than we ever had before. So in this process, right, to successfully get to the moon, one of the biggest steps is landing on the moon safely, right? So in order to do that, there is this interaction that we saw during the Apollo missions happen and occurs in many planetary bodies called plume surface interactions or PSI. So basically what this interaction does is we have what I call regolith particles. They're just like the dust, the soil on the moon, right? And they will interact with the rocket exhaust plume on, uh, from the spacecraft landing. And then what this causes is uh, that interaction to just shoot out ejecta at really high speeds. Um, and like you see here on the picture on the top, this is from the Apollo missions. So the camera was positioning to look at the surface and from a high altitude, 
you can see all the features of the surface no problem, right? So you can see the craters, we can see where we are landing, but then as we get closer, now you just see a blurry image, right? So that huge thing is just a sheet of dust being picked up. So that's what this interaction is causing. And what we learned is that this interaction causes a lot of damage. So they're going at really high speeds, but also the dust is really sharp and abrasive. Um, and that's because the moon has no atmosphere, a lot of other science that I don't have enough time, but basically it will cause a lot of damage. So it can interfere with navigation systems. It can hurt uh, surface hardware that's on the surface and a lot of those things. So now my thesis revolves around studying this process and how to better predict what's going to happen when we go back to the moon and uh, to come up with mitigation strategies to ensure that this doesn't become a problem, especially as we land multiple, multiple times and we plan to inhabit the moon. So that comes in, uh, what, what comes in is the instrument called Particle Impact Event Sensor, or PI, uh, so PI sensor. And that's that image at the bottom that you see, which doesn't look too fancy or sophisticated, but it's actually really cool. So it has a piezoelectric material that allows it to be very sensitive to these impacts. So it can count how many impacts, it can tell us what the energy of each impact is, so that we can understand what threats it will be in the future. Um, and then with that, I mean, I am trying to answer these two questions. So how to quantify that damage of PSI that we see, and then also determining the long-term uh, contamination that we might see. So again, every time we land, we're ejecting these large amounts of particles and they settle down, but then they can settle down on solar panels, on habitats and things like that. So that is my whole research is, is working on this instrument. And specifically, it will measure again, the kinetic energy and the flux. So hopefully it will then be, we can use this instrument to get real in-time flight data to be able to validate numerical analysis that have been done. So there is theoretical work, but now we can prove that it is right and working. We can come up with prediction capabilities and uh, come up with mitigation strategies. And that's it. <laughs> right on time. Thank you so much. All right, our next, next inductee, uh, Bahar Chavla, is a PhD candidate in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Her research focuses on structural maintenance of chromosome proteins and their role in regulating gene expression. It's a mouthful. Bahar is an avid educator, championing student-centered teaching and mentoring the classroom and research lab. She led her department's DEI committee for three years, where she created foundational structures and advocated for initiatives, including the Horizons Undergraduate Research Program, which is a funded summer research program. So please, head on up. You got one there? Okay. And Ariana has set the bar, so now we all got to make it. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'm going to try this. I have a timer on my watch. We're going to go. Okay. All right. Is anyone in the audience six feet tall? Can you stand up if you are? <laughs> all right, thank you. So if I took just one cell from anybody right now and stretched out your DNA end to end and laid it flat, it is a little over six feet in length, just one cell. You can sit down, thank you. <laughs> now, the issue is, is this has to fit into a nucleus that has a diameter of only 10 microns. For context, one of your eyelashes is like 60 microns in diameter. So you can imagine that's a lot of material to fit into a really tiny space. But we can't just scrunch it and shove it in there because DNA is a library. We need to be able to read it and use it. And so, hey, my drawings are gone. Anyway, <laughs> one of the ways that we do it is, okay, you see those circles? Those are actually spools. DNA is wrapped around little spools. And what the cell can do is just be like, all right, the spools I really don't use, the information I don't check that often, let's just pack it tightly together and push it off to the side and leave the stuff that I do need open so that I can get in, read it, and then move on. And so there are proteins that are actually able to move the spools around. And so, but the issue that we get into is studying how those proteins work in a living animal is really difficult because if we mutate the protein, for example, we risk inadvertently killing the animal. 
So this is where my model organism, Sienna rhabditis elegans, comes in, is that it has an extra version of this protein that I'm interested in that's similar to us and them that's only on the X chromosomes. And now I can actually do these experiments in a living organism. And so what I was really interested in, how do these things use energy, if they use energy? And what I was able to show is that normally this protein is on the X chromosomes. The X chromosomes stay nice and tightly compacted and our worms look great. If I say, okay, now you can't use energy anymore, all of a sudden the X chromosomes blow up. They start really shoving into the other DNA and the worms, as a consequence of not being able to do this process correctly, end up having this dumpy phenotype where they get a little bit shorter and a little bit fatter. And what I'm hoping that we can do with this process now that I can do this in a living animal is to say, all right, let's see what happens to this entire system over stages of development in context of disease and stress, and then maybe over time use this entire system to really get into the idea of understanding that, you know, those abnormal conditions in which you can't find a mutation. What if it's an issue of organization? And that is the goal of my research. How did I do? Oh, I have 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things about this cohort is their ability to adapt and go with the flow, and you can see that today, so I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, um, now to our next inductee. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kimberly Diaz-Perez is a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Vivian Chung's lab. Her research focuses on investigating how the RNA sequence and structure affects gene expression and fu function. She received her PhD in genetics and molecular biology from Emory University, where she was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Gilliam Fellow. Kimberly is an avid advocate for individuals from underrepresented communities in STEM and strives to become a research scientist dedicated develop to developing therapeutics for human diseases. All right. Let's imagine there is a person with a particular disease. That disease might be impacted by changes within gene expression or simply whether genes are being turned on or off. Changes in gene expression might be due to disruptions within the central block, which is going from the DNA to the RNA, and that RNA would be then converted to proteins within your body that do their function. Now, my research is focused primarily on that first step, going from the DNA to the RNA in a process called transcription. During transcription, I want you to think about RNA polymerase, which is a complex as a little car that attaches to the DNA. I want you to think about RNA polymerase as a car that attaches to the DNA, and it, the DNA is a road that is driving through, right? And that road, you know, it could be continuous or it might have traffic lights. In this case, it's very interesting that it has been documented that RNA polymerase as a car actually doesn't just move in one continuous process, right? It actually stops and go at the promoter region at the beginning of the gene as it's making the copy of the RNA and as it's going throughout the road. And so I want you to think about, um, once you see the slides sorry, in, in the behind over me, um, it is the little triangle in black that indicates whether it is paused or not. And so this process is actually highly regulated. Um, and so once RNA polymerase is paused, you know, it can't keep going uh, for a little second. But once it is released from its proteins, using protein uh, factors, it can actually continue to drive along the road and just continue until it reaches the end. And so given the fact that this process is highly regulated um, to sort of ensure that the RNA is made correctly and gene expression is fine-tuned, I also want to find out, is our, does RNA polymerase pass throughout its journey, not just at the beginning, but throughout the gene body and as it's moving? And so I will be using a technique called our uh, precision run-on sequencing, or ProSeq, on control immune cells from 11 individuals. And really, I just want to assess regions of RNA polymerase accumulation, as shown here by the three cars in the middle, uh, bottom, in the bottom middle. Um, and so I want you to show, I wanted to show you an example of how this looks, and that would be on the upper right. Um, and I have an example of a representative gene where there is actually pauses both at the promoter in red and at the gene body in, on, the, on, on the right in purple. So that indicates that RNA polymerase does indeed pause at the promoter as we expected, but it could also pause throughout the gene anywhere, and that these regions are sort of precise across these 11 individuals that we have. 
And so now that we know that, I want to find out what is making RNA polymerase pause, right? And so I'm thinking, is it a traffic light in which specific nucleotides like ACGTs within your DNA or your RNA that are making RNA polymerase happen? Or is it like, are there any other events that are occurring simultaneously with transcription that is also impacting RNA polymerase? Ultimately, this work will provide foundational information into transcription and the effect I'm ending, yeah, and the effect uh, of transcription on gene expression, which could be then helpful for future therapeutic development purposes. Thank you. <laughs> sort of recent. Dosumu Ogumi is a postdoctoral researcher in robotics at the University of Michigan. She specializes in stair climbing algorithms for bipedal robots and holds numerous awards and distinctions, including Gem Fellow, Rackham Merit Fellow, and the MLK Spirit Award. Wami holds a PhD and two master's degrees from the University of Michigan and a bachelor's from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Committed to mentoring future engineers, she aims to become a professor. Wami. Yeah. I'm assuming you don't need my time. Oh yes, I have a timer and I have brought a script, so uh, I don't know if this is, we'll see what, how it goes. <laughs> all right. So I want to create a robot assisted world where robots of all types are working alongside humans from all walks of life. Well, thank you, yes. Um, so think robot butlers, robot firefighters, robots doing those boring and dangerous tasks while we humans get to do the fun and safe task. But for robots to be useful in our human-centric world, they need to be able to navigate through common human terrain, such as stairs. And yet bipedal robots, or two-legged robots, struggle to walk on stairs. So that's where my work comes in. My work uses humans as inspiration to get bipedal robots to walk up stairs. One thing that we humans do as we walk up stairs is move our entire body. Imagine that I grabbed your waist so that it's fixed at one height, and I tell you to walk up stairs. Not only will you look weird, but you're gonna have a hard time making any sort of efficient progress. Now, imagine that I let go of your waist. You will have a lot easier time getting up those stairs. And that is in essence the first contribution of my work. I created a new robot model that allows for bipedal robots to move more freely when they walk upstairs. In effect, I let go of their waist. What else do we humans do when we walk upstairs? We also engage our ankles throughout an entire step. Yes, this tiny part of our human body uh, contributes significantly to our ability to smoothly walk upstairs. Imagine if I put both of your feet in cast. Sure, you would be able to maybe eventually get up the stairs, but it'll be so much easier without those casts restricting your ankles. And that's the second contribution to my work. I remove the metaphorical cast on bipedal robots so that they can more easily walk upstairs using their ankles. The way that I determine how to move the robot's ankles is by using an intelligent uh, algorithm also inspired by human behavior. Think about how we humans can subconsciously use sensory cues such as sight and feel to determine how we decide to move. We are good at anticipating the actions necessary to overcome any obstacle. I replicate this intelligence in robot ankles using something called model predictive control. So using the new model of the system from my first contribution, I anticipate or predict how that model will react over time and then con compute control values to ensure that I achieve a desired behavior, climbing stairs. Hence, model predictive control. I envision a world where robots work alongside humans to make a difficult task more equitably achievable. But if our two-legged robots can't even climb upstairs, that vision is impossible. But with my controller, we ascend one step closer to this dream. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. All right, our next inductee is Raul Gomez, is a PhD candidate in higher education at the Center for the Study of Higher, higher and Post-Secondary Education, University of Michigan, where he also received a Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Theater Arts and Translation and Interpretation Studies from California State University, Long Beach. His research focuses on understanding organizational behavior and organizational change in higher education, mainly related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right, good afternoon, buenas tardes. Um, three minutes, all right. <laughs> I will take a little moment of privilege that I have the microphone. Uh, there's one person online that never attends things because it's often things that are taking place elsewhere. So I'm gonna say it in Spanish. Um, pero quiero reconocer a mi madre que está en, en línea y que todos los honores que he recibido son un testamento de su uh, persistencia y apoyo que me enseñó sobre la educación, así que gracias. So just thank her for everything she's done. Um, so, now my three minutes about my research. Uh, you might be familiar with some of the things up here, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are terms that we use often, we see a lot of universities use, we see very glossy brochures often, right? They're beautiful. But really, the work actually looks a lot more like the rainbow at the bottom, right? It's often not very clear. And um, I've always became very interested about why is, why is this work important, right? Um, and I took a class in higher education the first, when I learned that, well, the reason that we need uh, work around diversity, equity, inclusion is because a lot of these institutions were not created for individuals like me and mine, right? For a lot of us, and we needed spaces. So throughout history, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities have been created to create a more of a sense of belonging and opportunities for students who are often marginalized and left out. And we can think about diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity agendas, cultural centers, they're all initiatives created in mind because, again, um, a lot of the students uh, didn't feel supported, right? Um, in one, this quote is, I opened my dissertation, my chapter one of the dissertation with this quote, because it's whether it's race, ethnicity, or other identities, really, uh, higher education institutions are really struggling to create space, but it's not just creating space, but it's how are we really helping students who come in to helping them thrive. And this is really, uh, a lot of the research on diversity, equity, and inclusion focuses on the individual experience. A lot of what we're doing, um, it's, uh, so my interest is really how are we focusing more on a structural way in thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, not as an individual characteristic, but as an uh, organizational process that really helps shift structures and create cultures where really we can reach a transformative change in higher education where all, whether students, faculty, and staff that have diverse identities can uh, work and thrive. And my dissertation focuses on understanding this from mid-level administrators to understand how they make sense of this work and actually implement these changes in higher education. That was my three minutes. Gracias. <laughs> off your applause. Please applaud as long as you would like. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Our next inductee is Cassidy M. Jungles, who's a PhD candidate in pharmacology at the University of Michigan, where she studies breast cancer therapeutics. Cassidy is a Center for the Education of Women Scholar, a Europe Outstanding Research Mentor, a Rackham Merit Fellow, and a T32 pharma pharmacolo Yes, sciences training program trainee. I apologize, I'm getting over a sickness and I, I'm pushing through for y'all. Uh, she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from St. Mary's College, 
uh, of Notre Dame. Cassidy is passionate about increasing the inclusion of underserved groups in STEM. My name is Cassidy, and my work is focused on breast cancer. So breast cancer is a common cancer diagnosed among women. In the US, approximately 300,000 will be diagnosed with breast cancer in 2024, while over 40,000 will ultimately succumb to their disease. My work is focused on triple negative breast cancer, or TNBC. TNBC is often found in young patients of color and often has really poor prognosis rates. Specifically, it's often found at later stages after the cancer has already spread throughout the body and at higher grades, meaning the tumors themselves are a lot harder to treat for clinicians. Importantly, TNBC, as its name infers, lacks the three most commonly found hormone receptors found in breast cancer. Because of this, we're very limited in how we can treat these patients in the clinic because we can't prescribe these commonly used hormone therapies that have really advanced breast cancer research and therapies in recent years. My thesis work overall is focused on combinational therapies, so how can we use the tools that we have as clinicians and as MD PhD students in our toolkits to ultimately increase the efficacy of these therapies in breast cancer patients? So my work is focusing on developing novel strategies for treating TNBC patients. I'm looking at mitotic inhibitors, so inhibitors that target mitosis, or cell division in cancer cells, and combining this with radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is a common therapy that almost all breast cancer patients will receive throughout their, their treatment of action and when they're in the clinic and hospital. Importantly, I'm trying to see whether or not combining my inhibitors with radiation can ultimately sensitize these, cell these cancer cells to radiation therapy, causing a reduction in cell growth and survival, and ultimately promoting cell death. I also want to understand the underlying immune implications of these therapies to see whether or not this combination treatment can ultimately cause anti-tumoral immune signaling to ultimately rid the body of the cancer, as the immune system is a very complex system that has both pro-tumor and anti-tumor effects. Finally, my goal overall is to really translate these findings clinically to see whether or not these therapies can be promising for triple negative breast cancer patients in the clinic. So what are my findings? Throughout my work, I'm focusing on one target, monopolar spindle kinase 1, also known as TTK, TTK is a, cre a, a key mitotic inhibitor, and it plays a role in cell division and mitosis. What I found is that TTK inhibition delivered prior to radiation therapy actually induces radiosensitization in my cancer cells, or makes the cells more sensitive to radiation therapy. In this mechanism, we can then prescribe patients this inhibitor with radiation to not only reduce the amount of drug given in the first place, but also control the tumor's tumor growth and also overall survival of the patient. Importantly, I also find that combined TTK inhibition and radiation therapy can actually trigger anti-tumoral immune signaling, in a sense, activating the immune system to eliminate the cancerous cells of the body. Now, future work in my thesis is really going to be focused on understanding the mechanism underlying these effects in vitro and in vivo, and also understanding whether or not there's any racial differences in TTK and also expression of these mitotic inhibitor pathways. And thank you for listening. <laughs> All right, thank you. Our next inductee is Dr. Parker Miles. Parker is a Virginian languishing in Michigan until his PhD is conferred in May. His words, not mine. Um, <laughs> he studies black youth technology cultures and the mutual constitution of black folks online and offline selves. In his dissertation study, a critical ethnography of student designed after school makerspace, he uses theory from science and technology studies and black studies to make sense of black youth cyborg literacy practices. He leaves the University of Michigan with three sole author publications. I uh, spent the last year and a half working with some of the coolest kids I've ever met in my life. Um, I started this dissertation with the uh, assumption that schools are anti-black, that like by their very structure, they're designed to bring students up into a world where their vision for themselves is limited, is truncated. It shrinks them into a version of themselves that's palatable, that's tolerable, that's productive, um, that is individualistic. It's the American way, after all. The second assumption that undergirded this dissertation was the understanding of technology as mutually constituting our lives. Um, in both these circumstances, I invoke cyborgs. First, from Donna Haraway, uh, the human-machine hybrid, 
um, doesn't really understand the distinction between online and offline. After all, you probably text your grandma. Students in particular uh, these days have any number of ways that their online lives take on a lot of meaning. They're, in addition to their SAT scores, their grades are calculated online. Um, they make a lot of friends online. They endure a lot of violence online. Um, the second cyborg um, is from Joy James. Um, it's a rebel intellectual rejecting victimization. These folks recognize that the worlds that they grow up in are not designed for them, that are, in fact are designed to abject them, to put them at the nadir, the bottom, the opposite, the other, in order to recreate and reconstitute whiteness as something that is a, to be aspired toward, um, not only politically, but also economically um, under racial capitalism. With all that said, uh, I wanted to hang out with these kids and give them an opportunity to do what they wanted since they have so few of those opportunities in their lives. Um, so I started an after school makerspace um, at a high school in Detroit. I got access to about $10,000 of emergent technologies, uh, VR headsets, 360 cameras, 3D printing, music production software, um, among others. And I told them that it was theirs to do with what they wanted. Um, and what they did was uh, create a space where they could be themselves, where they could be whole, where they could be heard, where they could be happy. These are all things that they said themselves um, in the data that I collected as quite opposite from their experience in school, which the data suggests is typical of black kids' schooling experiences. Um, they created what folks call a loophole of retreat, um, which after Harriet Jacobs is a, a place in separate but within enclosure where black folks can be free. Um, there are spaces that I didn't intend to create but that these students designed on their own um, by dint of getting their needs met. I found that um, in addition to creating this space, that it was a space in which they practice what I call cyborg literacies, right? Sense-making, self-making, world-making, joy-making practices, all of which constitute black refusal, right? It's a refusal to accept one's position in society. It's a refusal to accept the status quo as one that they should try to join into or grow into, um, even when, and especially when, that goes against the mores of not only the school, but society writ large. It was a place where these kids were free and happy. Um, as you can see, they really enjoyed hanging out together, um, making, creating, but especially dreaming of worlds that are better than this one. Thanks. is Dr. Maribel E. K. Okie, uh, who holds a dual degree, PhD and MS at the University of Michigan in chemistry and computational medicine and bioinformatics, and she also hails from the U.S. Virgin Islands. With a BS in biochemistry from the Catholic University of America, Maribel's research focuses on the human microbiome's impact on health. Her groundbreaking work on the oral microbiome's role in cancer development earned her prestigious awards, including the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship. Committed to diversity and inclusion in STEM, Maribel mentors students and co-founded initiatives like the Chemical and Biological Science Recruitment Initiative. Her ultimate goal is to become a tenure-track professor leading an omics-based human microbiome research while championing diversity in academia. Unfortunately, Maribel uh, did have a medical emergency right before this, and she wasn't able to make it today, which hurts my heart because she's the best, but <laughs> um, we're hoping maybe she can sneak by and take some pictures with us after, so you may be able to say hi to her in just a few moments. She had a really cool slide, though, so I'm going to go through. You can see. I watched her presentation at Yale. It was amazing. I was terrified, and I went to, booked a dental appointment the next day. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> um, our next inductee is Cecilia Solis Barroso a PhD candidate in linguistics at the University of Michigan specializing in bilingualism and language contact with a focus on Spanish English and Nahuatl Spanish communities in Mexico and the US. Her goal is to challenge harmful language ide ideologies, emphasizing the value and complexity inherent in all languages. Supported by grants such as the Research for Indigenous so so Social Action and Equity Grant, her research is published in esteemed journals like Frontiers in Psychology. Celia. Hello everyone, 
I'm very happy to be talking very briefly about my research today. Um, and I have to begin with the core of it all, which is Nahuatl. Nahuatl is an indigenous language spoken in Mexico and some areas of Central America. It has approximately 1.5 million native speakers and about 30 language varieties. Huasteca Nahuatl is one of those varieties. Now, 1.5 million might seem like a lot of speakers, but unfortunately, it is considered an endangered language, which means that it is in risk of extinction if we don't do something to prevent this. Um, in addition to this, an important fact about the language is that most speakers are bilingual, which means that the actual number of monolingual native speakers is very, very low. So in my research, what I do is analyze the morphology of nouns in Huasteca Nahuatl. To give you an example, I can take any given word, such as the word totatahuan, which translates something to um, our grandfathers. So what I do is that I break down the word into the smallest units possible that carry meaning, and I find patterns, right? So for example, for this word, to gives it or contributes to the meaning of our, tata is the word for a grandfather, and one gives it the plural meaning. So in my research going to uh, my field side, one of the things that I've also observed is that there are a lot of linguistic innovations. So people are taking aspects of their Nahuatl language as well as Spanish for those that are bilingual in the two languages, and they're creating new words that carry the same meaning. So while some people say Tota Tahuan to refer to our grandfathers, there's other people that also say To Abuelos, Abuelos being the Spanish word for grandfathers and combining it with the to from Nahuatl. So in my research, in addition to just looking at the morphology of nouns, I also look at this variation and trying to understand whether the two words do in fact share the same meaning, as well as looking at who, is the, who are the people that are saying to Tatajuan and who are the people that are saying to Abuelos. In some some of the outcomes expected from my research are to contribute to documentation efforts of the language, as well as explore theories of language change and generational differences. Very often, people assume that it's the young people driving linguistic change, but here in this research, I'm also going to look and see whether these innovations and um, language diversity exist in the speech of the parents and grandparents. Thank you. Thank you so much to our inductees for sharing their truly impressive work and I'm really not understating when I say how truly proud of we proud of you we are for what you've accomplished and are continuing to be excited to see what you do. This is a little off book for a moment, but I do want to just say this is my first year supporting the Boucher Society at Rackham and this group of inductees is truly the most kind, inclusive and just fantastic group of people that I have encountered here at Rackham and I just it was such a pleasure to get to know them over these past few months and I'm, I'm so proud to be part of this work. Um, <laughs> I also want to thank the families, friends, the folks from Rackham, Dean Brammer, Dean Solomon, Zana, um, who attended today's event and support Boucher throughout the many years. Again, I'm sure I also want to speak for our inductees and everyone here when we say your support is invaluable. And with that, that concludes our planned program today. To our inductees and their many supporters, please take advantage of our professional photographer to get some photos done with your family. Would love to see a photo of those who brought their stoles all together. I mean, if you didn't bring it, you can also take a photo. It's okay. We won't count it against you. Um, but your beautiful 20th anniversary Boucher stoles. Um, and yeah, of course that. But other than that, we encourage you to enjoy refreshments and each other's company. And again, thank you so much for coming today.